So my title is very similar to Grace's title. I, I don't think we planned that, but also progress towards tunneling devices based on T TMD materials. So we got a, a nice introduction from Professor Reichman this morning on the TMD materials. And I'll, I'll review a little bit about 2D materials and, and what I term 2D, 2D tunneling and then talk about the same devices that Grace talked about, thin TFETs from a theoretical perspective, and discuss some experimental work uh, that we've done with the materials. Okay, so probably many of you have seen this picture before from a paper by Andre Geim about 2D heterostructures. So nowadays, indeed, many groups around the world are able to build up heterostructures like this, and for example, they might contain graphene, a layer of carbon atoms, or hexagonal boron nitride uh, with boron and nitrogen instead of the carbon. That's an insulator. Or some of these TMD materials like molybdenum and disulfide. Then you have the metal atoms in the middle and the chalcogen calc atoms on either side. Um, why? Uh, are we, why is my group interested in these? We're particularly interested in tunneling devices. So historically, uh, there's been a number of attempts to develop electronic technology based on tunneling devices. IBM in the 70s and 80s with their big Josephson Junction project and then Texas Instruments and others in the 80s and 90s with resonant tunnel diodes. Uh, but they were all unsuccessful on a large scale because of the irreproducibility in the tunneling, just like Professor Xing argued, you know, tunneling is so sensitive to the thickness of the barrier, and, you know, if that varies by one atom, or even worse, if it's non-crystalline, then there's inevitable variations. However, again, following Professor Xing's talk, with 2D materials, we have then a new possibility for truly putting down one monolator at a time. In addition, if we have two-dimensional materials on either side, the so-called electrodes, uh, then we have a special situation regarding 2D, 2D tunneling. So what's, what's special about 2D, 2D tunneling? Well, everybody knows how to do tunneling in three dimensions. We learned that in quantum mechanics class. You send in a wave and it hits the barrier and some reflects off and some goes through and off it goes. But now if my electrodes are just two-dimensional, there is no momentum in this direction. So how even does the tunneling work? What do we have to think about? And in that case, you have to imagine then electrons coming in from the side, so to speak. This is your junction, so they come in this way, they sort of tunnel across. Some go this way and some go back. As a matter of fact, I attempted to make an animation of this. So this is sort of like a wave packet in the top electrode. Here it goes, it starts tunneling. This, this should be uh, lighter here. And then, you know, it keeps going. Some of it will reflect back. I didn't show that, so that's the current coming out. Yeah, and there you have it. That's the tunneling process, much different than in three dimensions or in one dimension. Uh, and it turns out to be a difficult thing to describe theoretically. You can do it, but for this particular problem, it it's, has a small periodicity in this direction, but very large in this direction, and of course, very large in that direction. And to do this with first principles, density functional wave functions is, is intractable, at least if you want to do hundreds of cases and many materials. So there's a simpler way uh, that my group has been using, just using first order perturbation theory, the Bardeen method. In that case, we only need to know the wave function in the top material without the bottom one, or in the bottom material without the top one, and then you just overlap those two states, so to speak. You compute an overlap integral and you can compute currents. And that's what I'll show you for a broad range of materials to figure out how large the currents are. Um, so this, this started with work on, on graphene, again, as Grace talked about, the so-called SIMFET. Uh, we saw this morning, you all know, the energy dispersion in graphene has these well-known uh, Dirac cones. 
And so let's imagine a graphene insulator, graphene device, and now I'm going to look at the energy versus kx, ky in this direction here. So let me get rid of that, um, that picture just not to confuse it. And now when we tunnel, of course, we conserve energy. And we also, the important thing about 2D, 2D tunneling is that the waves, the lateral wave function in the two materials also have to match up. That's also true in three dimensions, but there's so many different waves that it doesn't have any significant effect in three dimensions. But in two dimensions, um, for a, a given wave vector, uh, yeah, you know, we don't have any kz, so there's only a single wave and it has to match up with one wave on the other side. And what that means is that if we, you consider states here, they can tunnel over, but these ones up here, for example, cannot tunnel here. Even though there's a state available, the wave vector, the k value is different. And so this would be a particular voltage between the two electrodes. Here, at, here's another voltage, again, just a single ring. But at this special voltage, when these uh, so-called Dirac points line up, all of the states can tunnel. And so on a simple IV curve, you would expect a large delta function um, for the, not only for the, uh, current, uh, the current, but also in fact for the current density. And in reality, of course, that'll broaden out due to various things like a phase coherence length for the, the lateral wave functions. So that's the prediction. You get a very sharp uh, and large peak in the IV curve. And um, that, of course, immediately can have device applications because you could put an additional electrode on the top and the bottom, a gate, and then you shift your gate voltage and you sweep this peak back and forth and you measure the current and that then is a transistor. Uh, this is assuming rotational orientation to address Professor Nadelson's question. In graphene, we can tolerate a few degrees of misorientation, this peak will shift around. But if it's larger than that, it'll go away. But I'll come back to that point later. Okay, and um, yes, actually we worked on making such devices together with um, Eric Vogel of Georgia Tech. We were not so successful, it's harder than it looks. And in the meantime, uh, oops, the Nobel Prize winning group here, here in Manchester produced these results and this is comparing to our theory and indeed the agreement is very well, very good. There's two places where they disagree. The magnitude of the current is quite different by several orders of magnitude and I'll come back to that point. And also there's a slope here in the experiment and we think that that's due to inelastic tunneling. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this was at low, low temperature here, yeah. But you can still have phonon emission, of course. Okay, then we, so that was graphene. The problem is the, what, what Grace defined as the subthreshold swing is not so good in those devices. Even though they have this beautiful sharp peak, it's not, yeah, it's not as sharp as we want it to be. And so then Grace and her collaborators proposed a variation on that. Let's use TMD materials with band gaps. So two electrodes, again, we're tunneling. And now there's more possibilities. You can go valence band to valence band, conduction band to conduction band. So I call that like band tunneling. So that, those are 2D, 2D tunneling. On the other hand, if you change your bias, you can tunnel from valence band to conduction band, unlike band. And that then is where you would get a sharp turn on in an IV curve. This is also called Zener tunneling or band to band tunneling. And this is what we're interested in for steep turn on as Professor Jing discussed. And that's what I'll talk about for the rest of the talk. Nevertheless, this like band tunneling would give you in fact two different peaks. Nobody has ever observed these peaks before. So that's something us and lots of other groups are, are working on. Okay, so for that unlike band tunneling, well, for either one, what about the magnitude of the current? Um, and recently, we've really wanted to, to define how big is that current? And so uh, we've applied that dft bardeen method using first principles calculations. Let me consider the case of tungsten diselenide. 
Uh, here's the band structure for tungsten diselenide plotted in the, the two-dimensional Brouwen zone here. And so if I had two pieces of tungsten diselenide and one had a voltage on it, uh, let's say we're tunneling from states here at the K point from the uh, valence band edge, it would be in an other electrode here, over to the conduction band edge. And it uh, seems like a good idea. Uh, but in fact, you can go and compute what is the, the actual rate for that tunneling. It involves in the Bardeen method this so-called matrix element, the wave functions uh, phi alpha and chi beta on the, the left and right hand sides integrated over that, that interfacial area between the electrodes. And so this is then a plot of this matrix element and what you find uh, the, the Brouron zone is shown in black. Let me take that away. What you find is, and, and I'm just considering going from the lowest conduction band state to the high end valence band state, all the way across here, even though mainly we're just interested in the K point right here. And this is the K point, and you see we're in a dark blue region, and this matrix element is darn small. And the reason is those states in the valence and conduction bands are just kind of orthogonal, just based on the detailed wave functions. And that was not captured in earlier theories, not from my group nor other groups. Uh, and unfortunately, it represents a big limitation. This is several orders of magnitude um, smaller than what we were thinking about before. We were hoping for values up here, these nice red values, but those involve states that would, would never be accessed in this particular material. You have to go from the lowest conduction band to the highest valence band. However, it turns out for other materials, the situation is not so bad. Uh, so this is a compilation of results now for a wide range of TMD materials. So all of them in these th thin T FETs, they have this sharp turn on and then a saturation, log of current versus voltage. And uh, we have this inverse slope, 60 millivolts per decade. We'd like to do better than that. So theoretically, we get an IV v curve and we see where the slope uh, here equals this value. We call that I60. And then we move to 0.3 volts over from the turn on. We call that I on. So these are plots of I on with the closed symbol, I60. And the line and the dashed line represents estimates based on circuit models of where we should be to make a viable technology. So the tungsten diselenide, tungsten diselenide, I just showed you, in fact, isn't on this plot. It would be way down here. This is tungsten diselenide, tin diselenide, zero degrees between the two lattices, but unfortunately their conduction band minimum and valence band maximum are at different places in the Brouwen zone. You get a big drop in the current, but if we rotate them 30 degrees, this is very close. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the materials that Grace showed in her final slide. So it's, it's getting close to something that could work. Uh, there are other materials that are actually better. Phosphorine, now the, the valence band maximum and conduction band minimum are near the center of the zone, near the gamma point. So rotational just, you know, misalignment doesn't matter very large currents here, gallium, selenide, phosphorine, even better. I'm plotting these against the energy difference between the, the two band edges in question. Ideally, you'd like to stay close to zero here. So phosphorine, phosphorine, yeah, it turns out there was another theoretical prediction about that just, just last week, actually, from another group. Uh, we, we haven't published ours yet. Um, yeah, their numbers are even higher, but I think ours are right actually. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we can argue about that. Okay, a few words about experiment then. We are um, trying to make these devices. We have a transfer facility uh, put together by my student uh, Sergio de la Barrera under uh, Ben Hunt's leadership here, and we can trans transfer little flakes of material, build up a heterostructure, um, thus far, we've just been studying the individual flakes. So this is a flake of tungsten diselenide on epitaxial graphene. This is an image from a low energy electron microscope. It's a fairly big scale. In principle, well, you can see this optically as well. And we're interested in trying to see how thick the flakes are. 
In the low energy electron microscope, you can measure electron reflectivity versus voltage. That's like where you're varying the energy of the electrons. Without going into too much detail, there's little oscillations in that signal, which for graphene, that is around here, points A and B, directly give you the number of layers. This is three layers, that's four layers. Unfortunately for tungsten diselenide, even though this flake, if you image it at different voltages, it looks different. Clearly there's different numbers of layers. Here you're seeing, in fact, right through the flake, you're seeing the graphene below. But these little spectra, reflectivity versus voltage, they don't change very much. There's a little shift, and that's showing you a work function change. So some, somehow that's related to thickness, but it's not a very ideal uh, signature. But my, my final slide then shows more recent results um, from, from Sergio, and I'm sorry I forgot to mention my other student, June Lee. They were both on the, the front uh, slide, and they, they've done a lot of the work here. Uh, this is um, CVD grown, uh, also tungsten diselenide on graphene from um, Penn State. And in AFM, you can see one, two, three monolayers. We look at the same thing in LEAM, and these bright little triangles here, those are the individual one or two monolayers. And when you go pick out spectra, we've been able to uh, discern reproducibly a difference between one monolayer and two, two monolayers. It's not nearly as big as for graphene, and we're starting to build up an understanding of, of why. But nevertheless, they are reproducible. So we're, we're on the road to identifying thicknesses. And then eventually, of course, we'd like to build up a full heterostructure. So in summary, I, I've argued 2D materials are interesting, both, I think, for fundamental reasons and for application. Uh, we've done recent work regarding magnitudes of the tunnel currents which I think allow us to choose between the various electrode materials. And the LEAM is a useful tool for characterizing. I should say these little flakes are fine for single device demonstration, but ultimately we, of course, need to use large deposited layers for wafer scale fabrication. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Thank you.